Hello everyone, I'm Ryan. Um, I realized that one of my lights went out, so that's the reason why I've been getting darker and darker, I suppose. <laughs> I guess I'll have to find, uh, buy a new light, but it's going to be a little bit. This is not a standard light bulb, but anyways, let's continue. Guru, uh, there's another question from Somalia. Uh, she wants to know, at Isha, there are many processes that involve tying of a thread around the hand of a person for their well-being. In Indian culture also, such practices are followed. For example, in Raksha Bandhan, a sister ties a thread around her brother's arm. What is the significance and purpose of Raksha Bandhan practice? Oh, they're tying that plasticky chinky minky on somebody's hand these days. The idea is to tie a consecrated thread. Marriage is also happening like that, isn't it? Mangal Sutra. Now, of course, they're wearing a dog chain. You are supposed to wear Mangal Sutra. Every year you are supposed to renew this because energetically it is prepared in a certain way that it does certain things to you. It is in the preparation of the thread. Normally we are using a non sanforized cotton thread or a silk thread which is not put through the chemical process. And we are using certain methods to energize this because these are materials which can retain energy for a period of time. So this was used to bind people in a certain way, to create a certain sense of security and stability in the system. But Raksha Bandhan, all these things have become very market-oriented stuff. Everybody is trying a plastic, the chinky minky stuff, you know, what's all… it's made of all kinds of things. No, it, these are supposed to be done… See, the, only the ritual has remained, the science has not remained, that's a problem. Over a period of time, we've carried the ritual, but we've given up the science of it. So let us say it so happened, stretching it to the limit. It so happened you are a surgeon, after a few generations you forgot why you do surgery. You just understand you have to cut up people. Then you better be in the pathology laboratory, <laughs> isn't it? Even there you cut with a purpose, not simply cut up people. Sadhguru, this is the last question from the social media uh, array of questions. So this question comes from Rim. He says that Steve Jobs was said to have a bad temperament. He often subjected his employees to profanity, fired them in public and push pushed them to the extreme limits of performance. He is also considered one of the greatest innovators of our time. Is such behavior justified as long as one delivers results? <laughs> hmm. I don't know. I mean... <laughs> it's really weird to say, but to say that sometimes you have to be mean to people to get them to go beyond their limits, I'd say yes or no. <laughs> but the results is also a yes or no. So what I mean by this is that <clears throat> there are people out there, if you genuinely push them, they will go beyond their limits. And then they'll look back on that thinking, it's like, you know what, I had to thank him for that because if he didn't do that to me, he didn't make, if he didn't be mean to me, I could not go beyond my limits. I would have never went beyond my limits. At the same time, you know, you could be doing this exact same thing to a different person and <laughs> they can't take it at all. And they, they either absolutely refuse to go beyond their limits or they've already went beyond their limits and just can't go any further. So it's really hard to say who can who, who you push people like this to and uh, who you don't. Is it justifiable? Well, <laughs> I don't know. Because there are some people who do need to push and there are some people who don't need to push. There are many ways of pushing people beyond their limits some takes a very long time and sometimes just screaming at them <laughs> may push them pretty quickly. Um, so it's hard to say. Um, generally speaking though, it's no, but I guess if, you get, if, you're, if, if you're a person who can really, really uh, tell uh, a person if this is the kind of push they need, then maybe. It's, it's really hard to say, hard to know for sure, but Uh, I don't usually like to make a personal comment about somebody who's already dead, okay? <laughs> uh, 
But um, I'm asking you, one thing is what we do, another thing is what kind of human beings we are. Is it important what kind of human being you are? Hello? I did something, what did I do? I designed a phone. If you did not design it, Koreans would have done it, Chinese would have done it, Indians also beginning to do it. Yes or no? There is a certain brand building process in the world with which you can build a brand. And see, I want you to understand, you're a doctor at least on the way. Does this body need oxygen or carbon dioxide? Oxygen. Oxygen. But people pumped carbon dioxide into a bottle and said the real thing, Coca-Cola. It's the largest brand on the planet, all right? More people drink, at least all these years, more people drank Coca-Cola than people did yoga or people did anything else. In the remotest part of this country, if you went twenty years ago, if you utter the word yoga, they didn't know what it was. But if you said Coca-Cola, they knew what it was. So just because it's branded like this and marketed like this, does it become that your system has become such it likes carbon dioxide and doesn't like oxygen, is it so? No. Only now because of uh, the Prime Minister pushing yoga in a big way, today every village seems to know the word yoga, even if they don't know the practice of yoga. Branding again, again branding. So you can brand things in so many ways, you don't go by these things. You tell me, is it important that you are a pleasant and wonderful human being? Is it important for you? Otherwise you look at it the other way around. Do you like to be shouted at right now? I can shout. You… you like to be shouted at? No. Then why do you think somebody else likes it? Hello? You don't want to be abused, isn't it? Would you like to be abused? Then why do you ever think that somebody else likes it? When you don't like it, you know it is not nice to you. Why do you do it to this person? Why do you do that? You lost your humanity fundamentally, isn't it? So, just because you made a lot of money, I don't think it means anything. Alexander, the great idiot, conquered half the known world. What does it mean? It doesn't mean a damn thing to me. Only a fool would call such a man as a great man. He just spent his whole life killing people. And you call him Alexander the Great? No, they forgot his third name, it was idiot <laughs> So, please do not go by these standards. Somebody has this much money, so he becomes a great man? I don't think so. Anyway, you untimely death with cancer happened, you didn't pack all your money and go, there's no container service in the end. He went to the extent of saying that whatever at that time he had some forty-six billion dollars personal worth, he said, even if I have to use this dollar of it, I would like to destroy Google. So you want to kill it, even if you lose all your money. There are people like this, even if both my eyes go, I want to take one eye of hers. This is the crudest level of existence as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> well, yeah, I definitely do agree with that for sure. But again, um, it's not to say that again, screaming, yelling, at people, it's necessarily the greatest thing, but there are some people that kind of need that little extra push. And there are some people out there, I, I remember seeing that said, you know, when I think about it, uh, it was really a, the only way to really push me uh, to my limits. Again, it's a very, it's very few people who actually seize that as a, uh, a way to push them beyond their limits. <clears throat> and it's generally, they're very rare. Um, I guess Steve Jobs is kind of one of them that um, he pushed himself to the limits. And there are people out there who need assistance pushing themselves beyond the limits. 
but yeah, Steve Jobs art was like, mm. and also I, I, that's to say, I was talking about Alexander the Great. He was trying to make a unified country, I believe. Obviously, it failed. Um, and the thing I think about is something that um, I don't know if it's true in China, but it's a movie that I absolutely love because it's a very good movie called Hero with Jet Li, and I don't know if it's ba if there's some truth to it or not. But the idea behind it is pretty interesting, and it sucks that, you know, it kind of, um, had to be this way, I guess you could say. At least in the past, perhaps, I don't know. Um, the idea, uh, jeez, oh, spoiler of the movie, anyway, a little bit of spoiler of the movie. The, <laughs> if you haven't seen it by now, I guess it's too late. <laughs> Anyways. Um, I'll hold my hand up. If the ha when the hand goes down, it means it's clear. If you want to skip this part about the movie Hero, I'm gonna put this hand down, and you can you can listen again. So the movie Hero talks about uh, they're trying to assassinate the Emperor of, of China, and um, and the reason behind it is because he's going around killing people, villages and stuff. Um, and so they hired an assassin to try to kill him. That the, because he has a, a unique technique that can kill someone within a certain amount of distance. But whenever he finally got there, the Emperor t talked to him and realized that it was, he was an assassin sent to kill him and it was already too late. But he then talked to the assassin and said something like, how can we, how can we unite? Or he said something along the lines of, how can we consider ourselves one people when we all speak different languages we all have different cultures and we're all just warring at each other and, and what I'm trying to do is trying to unite the people under one banner under one culture and under one uh, r roughly a speech like this I, I, again it's been a while since I watched it but it, essentially he's trying to say one. I, I believe it's called one land was the idea or our land that's it <coughs> sorry our land Meaning that he was trying to unite the different tribes to become one country. Um, so he told he he essentially told this to the assassin, and the assassin understood what he was trying to do now, and he realized that you know all this warring was for a purpose, was to unite the people. Pretty terrible way to unite the people, but you know when people don't want to um, when people don't want to unite, um, or they're not willing to unite, they'll they'll fight you, of course. Obviously, you're forcing them to to go into uh, into your nation, but the thing is, though, is that unless people unite freely, they're going to keep fighting each other. Just because, again, you look at humanity with all the differences and stuff, where we're f even internally in the United States, people are fighting each other, even though they're all under one one um, idea. But it's because of trying to reduce the differences, I suppose. So, or at least you know, the United States is not fighting. Uh, each other because we're different tribes or different cultures per se but we're just fighting over different things this time and I think if you watch like history of the world you saw that China was in civil war for so long constantly fighting amongst each other again it's like I, again if that the YouTube channel is true about the history of the world China just kept it's, it was in constant civil war in a sense civil war um, even though it wasn't you know, a united China fighting itself, it's different tribes fighting itself, then uniting under different names where you see the empire expands so big, then shrinks down to many different tribes, then all united again, then all break up again. It was really crazy. And so I get the idea of them trying to unite the country. Um, obviously there's many ways to do it, but again, not everyone's gonna like willingly join. <laughs> it's terrible, it's terrible, but it was just the past. You kind of have to you kind of have to accept that in the past, obviously, because there's just that's what was done. Anyways, but yeah, ho hopefully the idea is there. So that's what Alexander was trying to do. That's what a lot of kings and conquerors were trying to do. He was great because he was a great conqueror, not because he was uh, maybe compassionate or anything like that. Uh, great doesn't necessarily mean. Um, uh, compassion or a great person it just means a great conqueror now coming to the most awaited part of this event what is that you're going to dance <laughs> um 
now we'll be opening uh, you can ask sadguru questions you yourself audience members who would like to ask questions please raise your hands and the volunteers will come turn it on please namaskaram sadguru i am geetanjali and my question to you goes like this i've come across two common myths if you can hold them associated with organ donation one is that if someone donates their organs they will not have those organs in their body in their next birth and second is that you don't get mukti do you agree with this if not what would you like to say to clear the misunderstanding of the masses thank you how many idiots are going to get mukti first of all <laughs> the brain that you never used if it can be used after you're gone it's a good idea isn't it hello so see there are certain aspects to it which has been misunderstood and mispropagated today medical sciences are also looking at this with great curiosity that after a person is medically dead certified dead next 10 to 12 hours a phenomena is happening in the body you, you know this hmm? so when this phenomena is happening if you start cutting up the body it will disturb that phenomena but in the yogic systems we have known this for a very long time and we have systems with which we want to hasten that as quickly as possible If you haste in this and that process is over, after that what you do with the body is nobody's business, okay? You can even give it to the local zoo as food. It won't mean anything except for people's emotions. But when the phenomena is on, if you disturb it, it has certain impact. It's not like if you gave away your liver, you will come without a liver. Then what's the problem? If you can function well without a liver, so many people are functioning okay without a brain. So what is the problem? <laughs> so uh, this nonsense should go. But at the same time, I meet lot of people who, lot of particularly society ladies, taking up organ donation as a mission in their life. Oh, everybody should donate their organs. Donate their organs. Don't push it beyond a certain point. because it has other consequences already it's happening big time if you are not aware of it in certain countries see whatever liver kidney whatever you have the organs all of them are designed to last for a lifetime except in a few cases injury or you drank yourself to death or you're trying to you did so many things wrong now i every day drinking and my liver going but i want your liver now it's a very dangerous thing please know this you must understand it's not now during hitler's time they tried to harvest organs and try to put it in other people it didn't work they didn't have the science understanding but they tried even today i hear lots of things in cambodia vietnam people are being captured and their organs stolen and it is being transplanted somewhere else where people can pay money for it and you know it's happened in india all right so do not take organ donation beyond a certain point where it is needed with somebody's consent somebody gave it out of their love for someone else that's a wonderful thing how wonderful it is i'm willing to give away a part of myself to make someone else live fantastic it is but if i capture you and take your two kidneys and put it into my grandmother's body this is a horrible process isn't it so we must be very cautious about this we may do one thing with a certain intent but where will it go we must be able to see the consequences of our action don't push it too far organ donation organ donation yes it must be there it is an expression of compassion for another human being a human being that you do not know somewhere you want to give it fantastic 
but we must be very careful, it should not be pitched up in the society and create a marketplace for that. Once you create a marketplace, you cannot stop exploitation. You cannot. Nobody can stop it. I don't think that's what she meant, though. <laughs> uh, I'm guessing... Uh, I, I don't know what this process is. He's talking about, about the... Once the body's dead, there's a certain process that you have to hasten. Then after that, you know, whatever... You can do whatever with the body. Um, I do believe that people should be organ donors. Um, again, I, I think what he's, what he's going for is like the black market, of course. <laughs> now... <laughs> I... Th oh... <laughs> I mean, there's going to be people that's going to be exploiting for sure. Um, but you can't stop those people. Whether you're an organ donor or not, if they want your org organs, they're going to take your organs anyway. So it's not because you registered to be an o organ donor that all of a sudden your organs are going to be targeted, like high priority. It's not. It, the people who exploit the stuff is going to try to take it from those who are most vulnerable, that they can take it easily without any question and that they can sell right away. So being an organ donor is not going to make you a priority target saying, hey, this guy's going to be very easy. At least, um, yeah, because again, like I said, if you're the easiest target, whether you're an organ donor or not, you're going to be a target. If you're a difficult target, whether you're an organ donor or not, you're probably going to be the last in line. You will still be in line because you never know when you're the most vulnerable at the time. So in the United States, obviously, in, in most countries, most countries, I think in all countries it's technically illegal, but some people don't enforce the law. So uh, whatever, whatever country that may be. Um, I mean, even uh, the black market uh, exists in even Western countries and Eastern countries, all countries around the world, but even in countries where that's highly illegal, it still exists there. Um, so, again, being an organ donor or not doesn't stop people from taking your organs. I want that to be very clear. Whether you have, like, they're not going to check your like, oh, not an organ donor, I guess I can't take his organs. <laughs> no, 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 they're going to take your organs regardless. The, the, the main thing is whether you're an easy target or not. Um, so, generally speaking, the organ donation uh, mark, thing on your ID card, I don't know if how it works everywhere, but in the United States, if you have your ID card, it says you're an organ donor. Uh, it doesn't mean that the, the doctors are going to kill you um, and take your organs from you whenever there's a slight question whether you survive or not. It's the last thing they look at. It's the only after they tried saving your life and they can't, what will they consider that? A lot of people are saying, oh, well, you know, doctors are going to kill you because they can make money off that thing. It's like, no, doctors don't make money off <laughs> taking your organs because that's not how it works. <coughs> doctors get salary. They get paid the same amount regardless of whether they do organ donation or not, at least in the United States. Again, uh, again, organ stealing, it's not a matter of whether you're an organ donor or not. you gotta, you got to understand that. It's the most vulnerable people who will be who will steal your uh, who will be stolen. Uh, their organs will be stolen. So whether whether an actual doctor does it or whether just some random person in the street, it doesn't matter whether you're an organ donor or not. If you're at a very easy target, they will take you. Know, and you maybe the question you ask, well, what's an easy target? It's like, well, I don't know. So walking down the wrong side of a street, maybe going to a questionable hospital, you know. I don't know, honestly, because I've never been in that situation, so I would not honestly know. But uh, the truth of the matter is, organ donor or not, if you're an easy target, you will be one of the targets. It's not to say that you're a target 24-7. <laughs> you have to be a bit realistic with that. Namaskar, Sadhguruji. I am Machani Somesh. Little, if you can hold it a little close. It's quite safe. <laughs> and my question is, have you ever regretted an answer you have given? If yes, what is that? If no, how can you be so sure of your answers? Did I say something that I should regret here, sir? <laughs> I don't mean like this. Huh? I didn't mean like this. Okay. Listen up. See, certainty of life is a wrong thing. It is not about certainty, it is about clarity. 
what you say, you s what you see, you speak, what you don't see, you say, I don't know. Because I am always willing to say, I don't know that, I will not say wrong things. Only if you try to speak something that you do not know, you end up saying wrong things, isn't it? I am not such a fool, I am not so arrogant in my life. If I don't know something, I'll say I don't know. So that doesn't happen. No. <laughs> it didn't seem like they were satisfied with that answer. The thing is, I'll say this in terms of that, like, have I ever spoken anything that I've regretted? I'm sure I have. I mean, good Lord, I'm a freaking human being. If I have it, um, I'm, I, uh, I, might, I might need to wake up from my dream then, because, uh, <laughs> or whatever this illusion is, <laughs> I need I need to be waking out of it, because uh, me not making a, a regretful decision in my past, it's uh, a bit questionable. Um, but obviously then, you have to have good... In I hate this saying. You have to have intent of being good. And there's a saying in, in the United States, I don't know if it's everywhere else, they say, uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Meaning that a lot of people make good intentions, but it ends up harming a lot of people. But I still believe in the fact that your intentions still must be good. Not because you want to pave the road to hell, but because you want to make sure that you're doing the right thing. And another thing is with that good intentions is also clarity. Because you don't want to... Uh, what is it? Like... The bi I guess I guess the the road the road being paved with good intentions is because if you don't know anything about that but your intentions is good you could end up telling a lie to someone because your intentions were good well that should be okay it's not you have to have certain clarity and intelligence with that because if you if you like you ask me how to op how to do brain surgery and I'm like and I have no no experience in that and I'm sitting there saying oh well my attention is going to be good so you just crack open the skull and then you pull out the brain and you cut off a piece of what's bad and you put it back in good intentions but not the right idea <laughs> so I think that's probably the intent of the uh, the way the road to hell is paved with good intentions is that you're trying to be good but you have no knowledge in the matter. It's probably more than that, but I'll, I'll let's keep it at that for right now. So obviously you want to have good intentions, you want to have knowledge, you want to do your best to answer a question that you have some knowledge with, and perhaps you even say like I do, it's like I'm not a professional in that, and uh, these are the best knowledge I have on it. So you're at least giving some advice to your best of your knowledge, but even sometimes then it could be pretty bad. So it's again, it's all up to you. I I say it anyway, like what I know, because I want that information to be put to use. Um, and I always say this that you know I'm not sure about it. Uh, this is what I've heard, but it's all up to the person to decide whether to use it or not. Namaskaram Sadhguru, I am Sahiti, final medical, find your medical. I would like to know in our daily life we come across bipolar situations like one side uh, we get praised for treating and the other side in the same moment if we lose a patient without any due negligence it's the blame on us. Like how should we internally fix ourselves not the perspective of others how should we internally fix ourselves like should we go over the pain or should, we, should the leg give the, eat us or um, should we go with this appreciations? Like how should we cope up with this situation? Mainly in our budding stages of our careers. <laughs> you should not listen to both. <laughs> uh, interesting. Huh. Basically you shouldn't listen to the negative because you don't want to eat you alive. And you shouldn't listen to the positive because you don't want to build up an ego and think that you can do no wrong. Be stoned. Then. Stoned? Oh, what are you on? Wait, I shouldn't go with the emotional happiness. No, no, I'll, I'll come to that. <laughs> See, uh, somebody else's opinion becomes important in one's life only when you do not know what you're doing. Yes? 
if you are very clear about what you're doing, what somebody says, good things or bad things, it doesn't matter. In fact, the best things that have ever been done on this planet always got bad press, largely during their lifetimes and it was only appreciated after they're gone. Today the time cycle has changed, it will come back sooner, appreciation will come back sooner. But you must not be doing things because of appreciation or fear of criticism, you must be doing something that matters to you, isn't it? It really matters to you that right now somebody comes to you with a broken hand <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> It should matter to you that I want to fix this hand as quickly and as well as I can, whatever means I have in my hands. If she comes to me when I'm in the orthopedic ward, I will treat her one way. Suppose in her… in a jungle we were out on a trek and she broke her hand, I will do in a different way, I'll take the local twigs and tie it up, all this fancy casing won't be there, but I'm doing my best, that much I know. It may not be the best treatment, but I'm doing my best always. This one thing you fix <laughs> Somebody else may come and say, see the way you fix this plaster is not good, you should have fixed it that way and this way and this way and that way, maybe he knows better, but the way I know it, I've done my best. This is all any human being can do, always. But you should not fall short of yourself, isn't it? What you can do must happen. In our lives, if we do not do what we cannot do, it's not a problem. But if we do not do what we can do, we're a disaster, isn't it? So you should not become such a disaster. So if you just stick to this one thing, our people will say many things. You must see in the last twenty-five years, what all accusations and criticisms they've made about me, the same people now they're all becoming… not just fans, they're becoming devotees. At one time what kind of abuse, really, even now there are some people who go on endlessly, endless abuse. People tell me, Sadhguru, how do you listen to all this? I said, just tell me what is the abuse going on because uh, I wish to know. Sadhguru, you should not listen to all this. I said, I want to listen because when you came and threw flowers on me, fell at my feet, personally it doesn't mean a damn thing to me. If it's good for you, you do it. Or when you throw stones at me, it doesn't mean a damn thing to me, okay? Because I'm hundred percent clear what I'm doing. Maybe you will take time to evolve and appreciate what's happening, but this is not being done for your appreciation. This is being done because this is my way. Let me tell you a little story. A guru was there on the banks of Narmada. One day he went for, you know, the bath was always a dip in the river, so he went for his bath. His disciple was holding his clothes and standing there because otherwise it's muddy if you keep it down. He went in and uh, he saw a scorpion floating down in the water, struggling. A scorpion is not a swimmer, you know. He's struggling, so the guru picked him up. The disciple screamed, don't take that scorpion, it'll sting you. Well, the scorpion stung him. The guru slowly walked down, slowly bringing him out. He stung him again and again. The disciple went on screaming, what are you doing? Just drop the damn thing. The guru walked and let him out on the bank and he went away. And the disciple said, what kind of rubbish is this? He bit you three times. How much pain is there? He said, see, what are you screaming about? The scorpion is doing what it knows best. I am doing what I know best. What are you talking? That's all. You're trained to be a doctor, you do your best, somebody says something, somebody will live, somebody will die. But the question is, are you doing your best? That's all. 
isn't it? See, the doctors who treated patients hundred years ago, in today's level of medical science, they may look silly and stupid, but they were doing their best. That's <clears throat> and real quick with that one, all right, this brings up a, a, a video that I remember watching. It was um, very interesting about childbirth and I think in America maybe or in Europe, just a Western country in general. <clears throat> I believe it to be a true story. Uh, yeah, I believe it, it was a true story. And um, This one doctor that just graduated maybe Harvard or something, a medical school, um, was seeing why were women who go to the hospital dying at a higher rate than women who were having childbirth. And so all these doctors were um, were essentially killing these women, not intentionally, but they're doing their best, <coughs> the best that they know. But a whole bunch of women were dying because they're going to this hospital. But they, they come to find out that um, this one doctor who was trying his best, trying to figure out what's going on, why is there why women are dying at a higher rate in this hospital than if they were to just give birth at home with like a, a midwife or whatever it's called back in the day I don't know come to find out this hospital was also you know dealing with dead bodies and you know infested um, wounds and stuff and once they're done with that they don't wash their hands and they go to the child rearing area and touching the women <laughs> whenever they're doing the childbirth so a lot of diseases were being transferred from bad you know dead stuff and disease stuff to live people so when they <coughs> when they found that out they tried i think the guy implemented like washing their hands and stuff and, it, and all of a sudden the mortality rate in the hospital dropped significantly so Again, this is the reason why I say whenever you do hell about the hell uh, is paved with good intentions, that this doctor had good intentions, obviously, but at the same time, you can't exactly fault him because germ theory and washing hands wasn't a thing back in the day. But thankfully, one of the doctors was just like, "What the heck is going on here?" and started start looking into these things, uh, you know, carefully. But uh, yeah, he had good intentions, but because without the knowledge, he uh, inadvertently um, started killing a lot of people. Not the the, the doctor that's doing research, but just doctors in general in this in this field hospital. That's all, isn't it? They let a more lo a whole lot of people die for small things because that's all they had. But they were doing their best or not is the only question. Because today medicine, science and technology has evolved, all kinds of things could be done. At that time, with what little they had, they did their best. Today also what you're doing may look silly in another fifty years' time. Yes, yes or no? Medical science will go to places where you being a doctor, what you think is great knowledge may look absurd and silly in fifty years or hundred years' time. Does it mean to say you're a bad doctor? No, you're doing your best. <laughs> That's all you can do. Please do that one thing. <laughs> I mean, does it say that you're a bad doctor? Yes and no. Obviously, back in the back in the time, no, because obviously you're doing the best that you can. But man, when you look at it in modern time, yeah, it's a pretty terrible thing that they're doing. I, again, I watched Dr. Mike, and he talks about like like practices back in uh, the olden times as opposed to medical history it is a lot of it was pretty terrible but you know it's what they is what they honestly knew back in the day it was that's <laughs> it's it's weird to say that's like that was top science back in the day you just think about what we're doing today what we think top science is may be like uh, barbaric in 50 to 100 years time it's it's kind of crazy Namaskaram sir. Uh, my question was already laced by the students panel over there. Uh, as you answered, we have to be calm, patient, and self-engineering regarding the that? doctor attacks. Oh. So, uh, what is the time period? I mean, uh, see, we ca how to safeguard our doctor frenity from these attacks? We need some advice or suggestions how to safeguard us from these attacks. Don't. Uh, I mean, 
That's true. But what you could go to Bengal. <laughs> like like I think I did give advice back in this is one of the first or second video. It's a sure fact you can go in there and say, Hey look, we're in here trying to help you guys out. I, I don't know how the attacks are done. I don't know if they see a doctor, they just start swinging right away. Or whether once a doctor makes a mistake, then they start swinging. If that's the case, then you can go and it's like, here, look, we're here to help you guys to fix wounds and heal wounds as best we can. If you don't want that, we can leave and we'll not come back. And you will not see us again. You won't see any doctors. We will not be healing your wounds or mending, your, mending or healing your wounds. You know, and just go to a different place that's willing to accept your health. But if they're swinging right away, as soon as, as soon as they see the doctor sign and starts, you know, attacking, maybe not 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 to go there. <laughs> it's the best advice from them. Add on to this. Uh, I'll come to you. <laughs> See, uh, most of the time, t correct me if I am wrong with percentages, 99.9% .9 of the time, most patients hugely appreciate what their doctor does. Right or wrong, they do not know. But just that somebody is looking at them and they are down, they hugely appreciate or no? Huh? Somewhere this minuscule 1.1%, don't make that a big issue, then everybody thinks we must beat our doctors, okay? Don't… don't get into that mode. Uh, this whole doctor thing happened because of the way a certain leaders responded, all right? Not just because they were beaten. And even for them to beat, there is a political situation there which supports that kind of thing. That doesn't happen everywhere. And at the same time, you must also understand, not all doctors are straight either. There are corrupt people who do all kinds of things. There have been <laughs> in uh, Tamil Nadu, there have been situations where dead bodies have been kept in ICU for over three to four days and they were caught with that and beatings happened. The doctors didn't complain because they were caught properly. So I'm saying human beings do this and that, don't make that the trend by overly talking about it. Here and there something happens, don't pitch it up, doctors are being beaten, beaten. Now people think, yeah, we can beat the doctors whenever we want. Do not create that situation. Generally, 99.99 percent .99 does not look at a doctor like that. Many people are looking at them godlike. Hello? So let's not create that culture simply by continuously talking about it. Yes, unfortunately it happened and not only that it happened, it could have been easily diffused but for whatever reasons it went the way it went. If the election results were not so close behind, I don't think it would have happened that way. Yes, there is resentment, there is certain things happening in the society, so don't take that as Everybody's attacking the doctors. They are not. Real quick with that, he's saying something about about not talking about it. I've always thought to say talk about it, but it all depends on the situation. Obviously, if there's a problem, you, want, you need to talk to someone about it. You need to talk about it because you you don't want the, that problem to boil over, <coughs> especially if something that's being repetitive. Um, but interestingly, whenever he said not to talk about it, it reminded me of Morgan Freeman whenever he was asked about the race relations in America, um, about racism or the perpetualness of that or something along those lines. He said not to talk about it too. And I think Morgan Freeman and uh, Denzel Washington, I believe they said something, I think Denzel Washington said something that's very similar. I've not quite understood it, Although, I will say this, I think it's okay to talk about it, but the problem is, is when you talk about it, uh, what it ends up probably doing is what's happening in the United States, which is where you have it where it occurs, but they talk about it so much to make it seem like it's a much bigger deal than what it really is. <coughs> so you start hearing like, uh, like, like, um, how do I say, 
like it's happening on an every single day basis when it's really not just because everyone's talking about it all of a sudden it's so common that you you look one way and then the other and then it happened over there and you look back you missed it because it's talked about so much so I think this is what he's trying to say I believe that you know when you keep talking about things even though things needs to be talked about there are certain ways of handling it that you cannot just talk about it because it could end up making the situation worse um, I'm trying to think because like you, you I watch again I'm, I'm a viewer of myself of YouTube and then there are certain channels to go ask questions it's like like they, they they just like oh yeah this happens all the time it's like okay when's the last time you had it? it's like uh it's like I gotta go they leave because they can't remember any instance of it ever happening never in their life and not around them but it's talked about so much like it's so common but yet they've never witnessed it and they've not they've only heard people talk about it but they've never witnessed it witnessed it themselves but yet it's so common it happens every day in the news but you know and that's the thing that's that's the problem whenever I guess talking about it perhaps talking about it gets out of control and I think maybe that's what Sadhguru is talking about where obviously it needs to be discussed but the problem is whenever it gets out of control where it should it becomes something that's supposedly common knowledge or very common but when you actually look at it it's not so common at all and it's barely even barely something there it's not to say that oh we don't need to talk about doctors problems about them getting beaten not at all but it's the fact that whenever you blow it up you make it think like it's something that's so much worse than what it actually really is and it's hard to have that fine line between uh, the actuality versus what's been hyped up do not create that narrative doctors can be beaten no nobody can be beaten especially not a doctor Oh, we can have one last question from the audience. Uh, hello. Namaskaram Sadhguruji. This is Akhileshwar Reddy, third year medical student. I have a speak, question. Speak up. Uh, in Telugu society, or uh, in, in Indian society, parents take up the responsibility to educate the children, to direct them into right career, whereas in contrast in Western society, uh, children take up their own cho choices to what they become and earn their living. So, how can this change in Indian society? Uh, I do not get the con context of the question. <clears throat> I guess it's saying that in Indian society, parents are forcing, in some sense, forcing their children into certain um, uh, degrees or education field. That happens in the United States too, it's not very common. Um, you have like, it's generally speaking, it's usually the rich people that will s I think it's usually the rich people that <laughs> that um, you know push children in a certain field because they want their child to be very successful and they know what field is generally speaking successful that doesn't ma necessarily mean the child's going to be happy doing what they're doing whereas you know more of the middle class area middle and lower class is that <coughs> I'll say middle class perhaps <clears throat> Yeah, I think I think most of them is that you know they understand that most fields, so long as they're getting a job, will, will provide them happiness. Because I don't know, <laughs> you need an education for you know certain jobs, of course, not all jobs. Whereas probably um, the poor people, uh, the lower income people, are probably the same, uh, kind of the same as like the rich people that they're trying to push their child to. Um, jobs or degrees that have high pay because obviously they're living poor and they want their child to have a very good um, future that they are that their child would become rich and not poor like they were so it seems like the rich and the poor have the same idea whereas the the prior the middle class which is the larger part of the country uh, are okay with their child choosing something to make them happy because um, because the middle class is just they just kind of I guess they're chill I suppose whereas the upper the 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 rich people you know they want to make sure their child is rich and and ultimately successful and same thing with the poor people you know they, they've struggled and they've kept their family together 
and tried to raise their child as best they can and want their child to be as more successful than they were so that they don't have to struggle like they did. You're saying here <coughs> parents are supporting the children till they finish their education or they're deciding what course you should take? Deciding uh, huh? to pay the fees, uh, hmm. to, you know, they make their main choice of career. Well, um, <laughs> okay about that real quick. So, I'm assuming that in India, um, I, don't, I, I don't know how it is, honestly, but I'm, I'm making an assumption here, um, that the parents probably pays for the child's fees in college, probably a majority is happening this way. And if the, and because the parents are paying for it, they want to make sure that you're getting a career that is successful. They want to make sure that they invest into something that's going to be successful. Uh, in the United States, that's very true too, again, with, I think, rich people mostly because obviously they have the money for it, and some middle class people as well. Whereas the poor, obviously, you know, they, they, <coughs> they don't have a lot of money, so the child, while going to college, will be paying some of it too, along with the parents as well. Middle class, um, most probably they'll get some assistance with the parents sometimes the child will pay for it in full they go to they take out loans I, this is probably well known there there's a very very heavy debt debt in um american society for going to college and taking out college loans luckily enough for me i didn't have to take out a college loan at all as a matter of fact i got paid to go to college <laughs> i got whenever i went to college i got money <coughs> And I was, I was very fortunate for that. Very, very extremely fortunate for that. And, um, and I'd have to, I'd have to pay for college at all. And I do remember there's this one, um, lady, I think she was working two jobs and going to college. I think she had a child too. And I felt so bad for her because every time I saw her, she was during the, in between classes, she was trying to sleep. And I really, really honestly felt really bad for her. I didn't have, I, I got paid, but I didn't get a lot of money. It was just enough for like books and for the semester, essentially. So it's not like I was making, <laughs> it's not like I was becoming rich because I was going to college. No, it was a, it's a few thousand dollars. Uh, so essentially my things paid for all my schooling, not the books, just the, the fees and the whatever else for college and whatever's left over was given back to me. And that was for basically for the rest of the semester and the books, which would not necessarily last the rest of the semester, honestly. Especially if I had a if I had to stay in a dorm over there, I'd have literally almost no money. I'd I'd, get, I'd still get technically paid to go to college, but I wouldn't have really any money. <laughs> Maybe a few a few hundred dollars or something like that. So luckily enough, I lived close by the college, so I could just drive there. Because a uh, dorm is super expensive, apparently. Please, why don't you hold the microphone here? I know you want to speak from your heart, but it works better here. Yeah! Oh, sorry. <laughs> Parents choose children's career, their uh, life, what they become. Is that so? They try to advise you a little forcefully. <laughs> but I don't think they decide completely. Okay, uh, I guess here's the thing. I guess if the parents are going to pay for your college, you're kind of, well, that's their money. But if you want to decide for yourself, then you're going to have to pay. That's kind of the true thing in the United States. Probably less than the majority. I think majority of parents in the United States are do start up a college fund for their children, and then they let their child decide what kind of schooling they want to go for fairly open about that. It's their life after all and hopefully you want them to make the wise choice. But most of the time if you look at the uh, United States right now, Jesus, this is a very big topic in the United States honestly. It's where, why I'm talking so much on it is because there are a lot of there are a lot of people who go to college and take terrible careers and they just they just rack up this debt because they think there's a job for it and there's not and there's 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 college courses on completely useless stuff or things that are hobbies and you know or if or things that are like uh i guess good for you know um starting up a business but it's not how to start up a business it's literally on 
on the selling, uh, not the selling, the creating, uh, the creative aspect of the business, but not how to start it up, how to start up, how to start up a business, how to regulate funds, or how to structure the business, because that's business class, which would be great for business, just all businesses in general. They talk about more of the, the creative part of the business, which then if you don't know how to start a business, that could be a terrible combination. But anyways, there are some parents who force who who will say I'll pay for a college if you go to this degree. Very that's more of a rarity. Most people assist with uh, children's colleges, and um, and there are some rarities, probably a little bit more common uh, than you have to get this field. Uh, the more common ones is probably where kids are paying off their own college and getting their own debt, and the parents can't afford it. They encourage you. If you don't go to what they want, your mother won't eat. <laughs> your father acts depressed. A little drama will happen at home. But if you are very clear where you want to go, you will cross the drama. But you yourself do not know what you want to do. Uh, maybe you decided better to take advice from them. You from somewhere you're taking advice, isn't it? Either from your friends or from your teachers or from your parents or generally the trend in the society, you're taking advice from somewhere. So in that parents also have a stake. Unless you are very clear what you want to do. I think most people when they decide this, they're seventeen, eighteen years of age, they have no clue what they want to do. They are being decided by social trends of the day. So why can't parents also have their say? They'll also have their say. So the most important thing is, there are two ways to decide a career. <coughs> what is needed in the world today? Or what is it that I genuinely want to do? Do I have such a specific kind of uh, inclination that I want to do only this. Let's say I want to be an artist, now I have a certain talent. I don't want my talent to go by going to a medical college, if I have the talent. But I just went and saw a movie yesterday where in that hero was an artist, because of that a very pretty girl came and married him. <laughs> now because of that you want to become an artist, you don't know what's a brush on paint <laughs> Now parents will say, shut up and go to medical college. If you don't get that, go to engineering college <laughs> This is how Indian parents are thinking because you must understand in the previous generation, if you did not get the right education, you will end up on the street. Today's situation is little better. If you don't do this, you could do something else. But in the previous generation, their fear was always this, if my child doesn't get an education where job is certain, what will happen, what will happen, what will happen? They're coming from that. You have to give an allowance to that, you can't just ignore that. But if you are very clear, what is it that you are talented for? What is it that you are going to do? Anyway, that's going to happen, isn't it? So it is not a question of Western and Eastern thing, West in something else is happening. You must see, I've been to so many universities across America and Europe. What I see is, in almost all the top universities, the students who are doing really well are just Indians, Chinese and Jews. Yes. <laughs> Asians in America are doing much better than white people. So if, according to what I remember hearing, again, <clears throat> which I wouldn't doubt it to be true. I think Jewish people are at the top, Asian right below it, white people, I don't know where black and Hispanics lie, and uh, maybe even Native Americans maybe, because there's some issues going on in the communities in these places. Um, but anyways, yeah, if, if you think uh, America is like dominated by white, nope, Jewish people are at the top, Asian is next then white people. White's third place, <laughs> then blacks and Hispanics somewhere in the bottom. Um, I don't know where Middle Eastern lie. Yeah, anyways, I was trying to think, is there another one? 
in that area. I don't think so. But yeah, what it's saying is very much true. I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't separate Indian and Chinese. It's just Asian people in general tends to be the uh, second bracket. Jewish tends to be. The, I have no. I didn't even know Jewish people were like a race. I figured a Jew, uh, Jewish was like a, a, a religion, but apparently it's a race. Or maybe they're just classifying it that way. I don't know. The white Americans are really dumb because all these three societies have good parental support. 100% true. And I guess a great way to look at it too, and, and this is again another thing I watch on YouTube, is the fact if you look at the, the, uh, the divorce rate in these communities, uh, Jewish people very, very low, Asian people very, very low, white people 50%, I believe, <laughs> or 30 to 50%, somewhere around there. Uh, single motherhood is on the rise in white people. Uh, single motherhood in black communities is like 70%, is very, very high. I don't know what it is in, <coughs> in, in Hispanic, uh, the Hispanic culture, I'm not sure. It, a statistic for that was never really given out of all the channels that I've watched. Because it's always, it's always, in America, it's always about the white and blacks and never really about the Asians or Hispanic. But they say people of color, they just kind of generalize everyone. But guess what? Asians are not part of the people of color, even though they'll say they're part of it. But when you really look at it, it's not because... Asians are doing so well in America. Um, I think if I remember my history class, I remember uh, one aspect of that. Uh, Chinese or Asians are in the West and when there were slaves then. Uh, I remember this one comment which was very astounding was that uh, slave owners were saying, you know, that these Asian people don't complain very much. They do their job. They eat. When they're told they do their work and you know there's not they don't get a lot of complaints out of them that stuck out stood out in my mind whenever i remember reading that in my history class i was it's like i guess they don't asian people don't really rebel or something i don't know it's, it's a really weird uh um when i heard that and maybe that's the reason why they're doing great i have no idea i don't think so i think it's more along the lines of family culture it's really strong in asian communities and um not so much and the other communities including white the whites getting worse i mean if you look in the past uh blacks were actually doing significantly better than whites in terms of the family and in terms of their work culture as well but something happened in um mind you they're doing great even during racist times the black culture was the black people were but uh as it became more free as I guess black people became more free and had equal rights to everyone else, including, uh, of course, including the Asian and Hispanic cult, uh, people, um, when, they start, when they didn't separate whites and coloreds. Um, for some odd reason, the black culture just, I don't want to say destroyed itself, but something happened. Uh, you can watch those videos on there, and I, they had their theories, which I think it could be part of the truth. But somehow Asian culture was not affected by it, but blacks and maybe Hispanics were. And now you look at the white culture, it's also being, uh, it's, it's a divorce rate, it's uh, on the rise. But yes, parental support, 100%. Unfortunately for the white kids, the local Americans, except for certain families, most of them are out of their family by the time they're 18. They're living with their boyfriend or girlfriend, managing all that. They're working part-time and they're trying to study. Of course, you get tired. Mm -hmm. What will you drop? Job or education? Education. Most people drop the education. So their numbers have dwindled. So small it's become. You really go to any top university and see everywhere there are… there used to be too many Indians. But today they are more Chinese, <clears throat> second is uh, Indians, third is Jewish people. Real quick on this too, um, <clears throat> I believe in a lot of the top uh, top universities in America are actually discriminating against Asian people because there's so many Asians there. And, um, and I remember hearing uh, on the news that, or on like news, I, I can't remember which university it is, but I think there's a there's a lawsuit going on for it. But anyways, supposedly that um, Asian requires like higher 
SAT scores or, or GPAs to get into a school, white people less than that and black people less than that. So you could say like 140 for um, Asian and like 120 for white and then 100 for blacks or something like that. It was, if you look at it, you can actually read it on, uh, on Google and stuff. It was very interesting. And I'm like, that's kind of crazy, you know, because there's, uh, was it affirmative action and stuff like that to help out people of color, supposedly, but actually it's hurting Asians more than any other uh, race. Because again, Asians are just like overly dominating uh, the top schools. So I hope, I, ho I can't remember who it is. I hope they sue the crap out of them for that, that racist kind of uh, affirmative action or whatever it is. Or whatever is going on where it's requiring Asians to have a significantly higher score than any other race to make it tougher to get in. And they're still freaking making it in, you know. It's like, it's like hmm, we, we set the score to the, the upper limit and it, they're still, you know, flocking in here like crazy. You know, I know, I, don't, I know the top bar is 150. Can we put it to 160 where it's impossible to get? Oh, Jesus. But yeah. I, I'm kind of curious as to what's going on with that because I, I do want to hear the end results of that, that lawsuit. All of them have solid family support. They don't have to go and work somewhere, they don't have to do something. All the parents want is you study and they come to the university, sit there and see if they're studying or not, what's happening, everything. Mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. other kids are uh, just drunk in the evening, doing those things. If that's what you want to do, it's fine. but. Uh, that's not called education, that's all. After some time in the society, who will dominate the situation will be determined by who gets educated, isn't it? So in that concern, parents want to push. But uh, I don't think that time is gone. For most of you, if you show a certain kind of uh, affinity or talent towards something, I don't think cruelly somebody will push you into one thing. It is just that if your father happens to be a physician, mm -hmm. he wants you to be a physician. I've gone through plenty of that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so… Yeah, he talks about uh, that. That'll happen, but you must be clear what you want. When you don't know what you want, it's… maybe it's better to listen to somebody who seems to know a little better. <laughs> Well, not only that, because if you, you have to make sure that what you, even if you know what you want, you have to make sure that there is job opportunities for it. Like, I want to be an artist, but if there, if, if that field has no jobs and no way of paying, just because you know what you want doesn't mean you're going to be making money off of it. There's a lot of that going on in the United States. Again, this is fair warning for everyone that, you know, be mindful of all these things. Like, just because you know what you want doesn't mean that you're going to get paid for going to school. And colleges is super expensive. Um, what else? Uh, there's something else I wanted to say about the race thing, but I don't remember. So let's continue. This is an extra long video. <laughs> oh, crap. We got Thank you, 12 more minutes. Thank you for answering all our questions so patiently. Uh, because of time constraint, I'm sure uh, there are many more people who are uh, waiting yeah, for your uh, answers, but because of time constraint, we'll have to end this here. Okay. <laughs> Can we extend it to one more question? Yes, please. Namaskaram, Sadhguru. I'm a huge fan of you. Oh, <laughs> I'm able to see you. Huh? If you're a fan, why are you there? You must be in the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> She replied back, I am Sadhguru, I am high right now. <laughs> Sadhguru, I'm so curious to know everything about life and this creation. So I have so many questions to ask. But you know everything, Sadhguru. So I want to know every, every information you know. So how can I gain that information, everything you know? <laughs> Say, uh, this is not about information. 
Even yesterday this came up, I don't know why all Telugu people asking the same question <laughs> See, there are different dimensions of human intelligence. Right now, you have an education system which is leaning on just one dimension of your intelligence, which is called as buddhi or the intellect. You are simply depending upon intellect. Intellect is like this. A knife? Do you… I'm going to ask you a question, all of you should answer, okay? Sharp or Do blunt? Do you want your intellect sharp or blunt? <laughs> so you understand that intellect is like a knife. It's a cutting instrument, it's a scalpel. So if I want to dissect you, I need a sharp knife. So if I dissect you, suppose I really want to know you, shall I dissect you? Hello? That's the way to know, that's the way you know human body. So if I dissect you, will I know you? I may look at your kidney, liver, spleen, this, that, but I cannot know you because you will be gone. You… you have dissected frogs and cockroaches at one time. Have you or has it stopped? Stopped. When we were studying, we had to dissect these things. And uh, we open up the frog, poor thing is nailed like Jesus Christ. <laughs> nailed to the wood. Whoa. And uh, his heart is beating. Okay, I, I, I went into dissection class myself, but these were all dead, not beating, still alive. And the smell of that thing, whew. Again, it's not like a dead smell, it's, it's a… Uh, the type of thing that keeps it, uh, I guess, from… Uh, what do you call it? From rottening away or from being… Yeah, rotting or or dying and not dying. <laughs> Essentially, it's keeping it fresh so that you, when you dissect it, that it won't have germs or anything. It's clean, and it's for the purposes of dissection. The teacher coming and telling, heart is beating like this. This is happening. This is happening. I'm just looking, thinking, what is the damn frog thinking about me? <laughs> you know, of course he can understand that much. What kind of an idiot is this that he opens up my body, looks at the heart pumping and says, heart is pumping nicely. <laughs> you would have just asked him, he would have told you, yes, it's beating. <laughs> so, by dissection you can only know certain things, physical things you can know. You cannot know life by dissection. But right now you only have a cutting instrument for everything same. See, if you want to cut something, knife is a useful instrument. Suppose I want to sew my clothes, if I use a knife, it'll be in tatters. That's all that's happening to human life right now because they're using a single dimension of intelligence for everything. They're using a knife to fix everything. I must tell you, there was a time when I crisscrossed India on my motorcycle, so I'm somewhere between Madhya Pradesh and UP, early morning, whole night I have… I'm like this, day and night I will ride without sleep. Up to three days, no sleep, I will be just riding, simply no destination. Simply I enjoyed seeing India, simply I rode, not to any particular destination. So full night I have been riding. Early morning around 6.30, I come to a place where there's one little tea shop. I stop there and those days and even now, if you're riding a chain-driven chain motorcycle, every few thousand kilometers you have to tighten the chain, otherwise it'll become slack. So my chain has become little slack, I have all the tools and everything to fix these things. But early morning, it's easy job to do, but your hands will become greasy, then you'll have to wash a lot to get the grease out. Then I sit down to have a tea, then I look, there is one little shack where is written Mubarak Mechanical Works. So I thought, anyway, Mubarak Mechanical Works, I saw a strapling young youth. I said, hey, come here. I said, this chain is loose, can you fix it? So no problem, I can fix it. Then he went inside his shack and came back with a chisel and a hammer. And I looked at it and said, what? 
you going to fix my chain with chisel and hammer? I said, yeah, I can do it, I can do it. I said, just wait. I walked down to his garage, Mubarak Mechanical Works, I walked inside. All he's got is a chisel and hammer and he will repair anything in your motorcycle. But after he does it, that's it. <laughs> after that nobody can open or close anything. With the chisel and hammer he opens the bolt, nut, everything and does work, but after that it's finished. I said, no, 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 you're not going to touch my motorcycle, <laughs> I will do it. Why I'm telling you this is, right now most human beings have become Mubarak mechanical works. <laughs> They only have a knife. With a knife they are trying to fix everything. It doesn't matter, mm. see, just look at this and see. Is it the educated people or the uneducated people who are ruining this planet right now? Hare? Education should have brought more sense, isn't it? No, they are trying to fix everything with a knife. The cutting instrument, they are trying to do all activity. There will be a mess that goes for a doctor also. A holistic, a more holistic approach is needed, especially with medicine, with all aspects of life for that matter. So, the important thing is this, there are other dimensions of intelligence. We have buddhi, ahankara, manas, chitta, like this. In yoga, we look at human mind as sixteen different dimensions. These sixteen dimensions have different approaches to life. If you do not cultivate all those, you are only thinking of life as storing information. No, you don't have to store information. It's like this, how much time do you spend in front of the mirror? <laughs> Half of my day. Half of my day? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't think a doctor got so much time to spend in front of the mirror. <laughs> Anyway, whatever time, suppose the mirror that you're using at home had memory and remembered at least ten percent of what it has seen. Today if you went and stand in front of that mirror, it would be a total mess or no? Hello? The reason why mirror is showing you just the way you are is because it has no memory. It might have seen ten thousand people, but it has no memory. Because of this, it simply sees everything just the way it is. This is what you need to do to your mind, it takes some work. Right now, you are totally leaning on one aspect which is the intellect. Tell me, if I take away your memory, would your intellect be of any use? Hmm? Hello? Your intellect is useless without the backing of the memory, isn't it? So that is what the problem is. Like I said earlier, your memory is your knowledge and it's your limitation because it sets a boundary. What I know, what I do not know is a boundary, isn't it? Between me and something else. If you want to breach that boundary, you must understand experientially the intelligence of ignorance because memory is not the way. Memory is a very small thing, it will help you to survive. It will not show you anything else. It will only recycle the same stuff over and over again. Recycling something cannot be considered intelligent. Machine can do that. You will see in the next ten, twenty years, you will see everything that you think is knowledge will be useless. Scholars who read ten books, suddenly they become very important. If you read ten books, you become a scholar, if you just read one book, you become a religious person. <laughs> and uh, suddenly by reading one book, how did you become a representative of God? I don't understand. Just reading a single book. We must look at this because this is very important. Human memory is very small. My phone has more memory than you, it has six hundred GB. It can do ten PhDs in a day. Yes, so people who are reading something, remembering something and they're doing something great, those days are over. What you need is, you need an incisive intelligence which sees everything just the way it is. For this you need a plain mirror 
which doesn't remember anything but simply reflects what is there. If you want to work on it, please come, you're a big fan, we'll hang you somewhere <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Whatever you do, this is a great possibility that you are in the medical school, still in the world, most of the population is unserved, so please, uh, whatever you do, wherever you go, just know this one thing that when people are sick, they are down. And when people are down, they need the best treatment. Hello? When I'm standing, you can fight with me. When I'm down, you must treat me gently, isn't it? <laughs> Hello? So, just know people who are coming to you, in some way they are down. You must give the best that you have to that person. Just do this one thing as a doctor, even if you don't become super specialist, just this will do wonderful things to people. Thank you very much. Okay, so I don't really have too much to say and this is one extra long... Whoa! <laughs> One extra long video. Oh man, I didn't want to keep adding more and more parts to this, so I try to cram it all in this last one. So anyways, um, this was quite a, I mean, I hope, <laughs> if, you, if you even made it this far, uh, take heed to a lot of signs in the world, you know, about terrible decision making skills. <laughs> What Siguri said there was uh, very much what's going on in the United States where, you know, children making bad decisions and going to college, the fact that that's their, that's their parents' money anyway, and you should be grateful that they're willing to pay for an education. You know, I, I, this gross, uh, this is the one thing I, I forgot and I wanted to say was, children have this sense of entitlement, like, well, this is the money that they're going to give me to go to college, why aren't they just going to give it to me? Like, they have that sense of entitlement that this is mine. I know, you know, if, if, if we get rid of entitlement, I think it'll help a little bit. Not everything, but I think it'll help uh, a little bit in terms of the person itself. I have been, I think I've been relatively grateful that I didn't have a sense of entitlement for the majority of my life, I believe. I think so. I think even when I was young, I've always asked for things and I never, I do not believe I ever said I was entitled to something, that I deserved something. I don't believe so. So I've been, I've been, I guess, grateful for that. It's weird to say, I am grateful to myself that I am not an entitled little punk. <laughs> Anyways, that's my reaction to say good at Pratima Institute of Medical Science, Youth and Truth. This was quite a long one. It was 2 hours and 13 minutes long. So anyways, if you like more content, please consider subscribing to the sound down below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.